Good morning, and welcome to online worship here at the First Presbyterian Church in Goshen, New York. This is Sunday, November 1st, All Saints Day. And as we do on every All Saints Day, we remember those of our congregation who has passed from us. We remember Edward Berry, Charlene Bischoff, and Sue Stewart. May they rest in peace. Let us now join in the call to worship, adapted from Psalm 34. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Look to him, and be radiant, so your faces shall never be ashamed. The poor soul cried, and was heard by the Lord, and was saved from every trouble. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Let us come together in prayer as we focus ourselves on the message of God. Creator God, you call us to love and serve you with body, mind, and spirit through loving your creation and our sisters and brothers. Open our hearts in compassion and receive these petitions on behalf of the needs of the church and the world. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. We all know how imperfect we are and so does God. But as we confess to him, he forgives us as we forgive each other. Let us come together in our prayer of confession. Eternal God, our judge and redeemer, we confess that we have tried to hide from you, for we have done wrong. We have lived for ourselves and apart from you. We have turned from our neighbors and refused to bear the burdens of others. We have ignored the pain of the world and passed by the hungry, the poor, and the oppressed. In your great mercy, forgive our sins and free us from selfishness that we may choose your will and obey your commandments through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And let us remain for a moment in silent personal confession. Brothers and sisters, in the name of God our Father, we are forgiven. Amen. The first scripture reading this morning is Revelation 7, 9 through 17. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, for every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever, amen. 
Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb and the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson this morning is 1 John 3, 1 through 3. See what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. The gospel lesson this morning is Matthew 5, 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are, the, are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for, you, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted you, the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of Christ, thanks be to Christ. The blessing of Almighty God is in the reading, the hearing, and the understanding and living of his word. Blessed is the name of our God. My life flows on. Peace of Christ makes fresh my 
Come now to the prayers of the church, followed by the Lord's Prayer. Let us come together in prayer. Seeing your children in bondage and despair, you brought them to freedom by your compassion and hope. Longing to create a people who would care for one another, you spoke simple truths about integrity and justice. Fill our worship with sighs more precious than all we value, dearest Creator. You came not to build a grand scheme, but to be our foundation of faith. You came not to choose sides like we do, but to be that peace which brings us together. You came not worrying about what lay ahead for you so we could see your kingdom prepared for us. Fill our worship with your grace more precious than our deepest fears, great comforter. When we cling to all which holds us back, you empty our arms, putting our past in a rummage sale. When we hesitate to stand with the lost, you nudge us forward with the wind of justice. Fill our worship with your peace more precious than the brokenness we grasp, word of wisdom. In Christ we pray, amen. In the several times that I've had the privilege to preach here lately, there have been more than a couple of Sundays where the lectionary gospel has been a bit challenging as to what I might want to say and how it might relate to our lives here today. But today, I hit a jackpot. First, the first reading is, was listed as the Old Testament reading, but we know it's not. It's from Revelation, the last book of the Bible. It's a bit humbling to think on Revelation, since my friend and colleague, the Reverend Dr. Peter Johnson, who will be here in the pulpit next week, wrote his doctoral dissertation on Revelation, and he's probably forgotten more about it it than most of us will ever know. But then second, the gospel lesson is about the Beatitudes. How does it get any better than that? But for a moment, let's go back to that reading from Revelation and some context. This chapter deals with the opening of the seventh seal, the last one. In the preceding two chapters, John the writer is shown visions of a ruler seated on a throne holding a scroll sealed with seven seals. John who? For centuries, the writer of Revelation has been attributed to John of Patmos. Patmos is an island off the coast of present-day Turkey where particularly troublesome people were exiled by the Romans. But is this John the same John who was a disciple? Some say the beloved disciple. And as much as we might want to think so, it's unlikely since even if he began to follow Jesus at the age of 12 or 13, he would still have been nearly 80 or 90 years old by the turn of the second century when this was written down. Other scholars believe that is indeed the work of the Apostle John and written much earlier. You want to be even more confused? We have these three letters of John, these three short books at the back of the Bible. Who wrote those? Probably someone who took the name of John as a follower of the Apostle, since they don't resemble any of the other writings attributed to John. So the answer is, we don't really know much of anything about the true authorship of these scriptures. But in the previous chapter, the first six of the seals have been opened. Those familiar images from Revelation of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The fifth seal has all the martyrs in history calling out for justice. The sixth seal brings even more, becomes even more psychedelic as its opening brings on fire, earthquakes, stars crashing to the earth, and people everywhere calling for the mountains not to fall on them, but on someone else. And then, in today's reading, is the seal opened? No, not yet. 
but just wait till it is. In the next two chapters, with even more destruction, plagues, pestilence, and death. So what does this have to do with All Saints Day? First, today's reading tells of countless multitudes before the throne of heaven, and all the saints of heaven singing along with choirs of angels, all wearing robes of white, washed in the sacrificial blood of the Lamb. Okay, wait. You wash your robe in the Lamb's blood and it turns brilliant white? Well, we know that this isn't a literal image. It's the image of all of us before the throne of God. No more hunger or thirst, no scorching heat, but being guided by the springs of the water of life. And who guides us? The sacrificial lamb has now become the shepherd, which is what we really knew all along, didn't we? And the blood sacrifices of the Old Testament temple made people clean and whole, just as the sacrifice of Jesus as the Lamb of God makes us whole. So now that I've spent a bunch more time talking about Revelation than I had originally intended, what about those Beatitudes? Well, when I said I got lucky with being able to preach on them, I should have been more critical. Because what can one really say about what is just about the most simple, beautiful, and perfect combination of preaching, poetry, and philosophy ever spoken? Yeah, Mr. Preacher, what do you have to say about all this? I ask myself. Well, first, look at two different ways to interpret the words of Jesus. There are the transactionalists who, when confronted by a problem or conundrum, will ask, what would Jesus do? Sorry, you might gain some comfort from the words of the gospel, but you still have to make up your own mind, not hide behind, what would Jesus do? I prefer to be a bit more subjective, trying to place myself not in what Jesus might do, but how I might deal with what he has already said. Put yourself in the sandals of one of those disciples sitting on that hill below him as he speaks. Or rewind a bit. Be one of those disciples who comes to Jesus as he settles into the shade on the hill and tell him there are huge crowds gathering and he needs to move further up the mountain. So up the mountain he goes, and what is going through his head at this moment? What am I going to say? Well, perhaps. Or was this divinely set down upon his mind and he already has it? just right. Remember, this is very early in the ministry of Jesus. He has recently been baptized by John, he's been tempted in the wilderness, and he has come along the shores of Galilee to summon his disciples. And according to Matthew, this is one of his first big moments. And being fairly new to this, I'm sure he's got some questions for himself. Believe me, I know all about being fairly new and having questions. So, what does he do? Put yourself alongside those disciples seated in the crowd, their clothes still smelling of the fish that they were selling only recently. Or what about those people further down the slope, straining to hear his words? Or somewhere in that crowd, we find ourselves hearing these phrases and having them wash over us like a great wave. For a moment, take the one, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The noted Christian scholar and author C.S. Lewis said, Heaven offers nothing that a mercenary soul can desire. It is safe to tell the pure in heart that they shall see God, for only the pure in heart really want to. And in our reading from 1 John, he says, all, And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. This hope in him is variously translated as faith. So here we are again at that central idea, that mystery of faith. But let's get back to the Beatitudes. According to Greek scholars, the meter and rhythm of the poetry of this passage is undoubtedly Greek in origin. Does that mean that Jesus spoke Greek, not just Aramaic? Probably. He was thought to have been pretty knowledgeable and Greek had been the language of commerce and culture in that part of Israel for over 300 years. How could even those simple fishermen of Galilee tally their catch and ask for a fair price without knowing some Greek and just maybe some math too? And if Jesus followed Joseph into the carpentry trade, do you think there was much of a demand 
in a dusty little village of Nazareth when there were huge projects being built in nearby Capernaum and Caesarea? And if you went there to find work, don't you think that knowing some Greek would be helpful? And as the blessed are those who continues, what about those peacemakers called the children of God? We think of ourselves as the children of God, and we are. And again, the letter of John calls us out as God's children now. We are peacemakers, not just giving our, to our offerings for that cause in the autumn, but acting upon it. A simple case in point was our agreement to host the painted trotting horse on our lawn, the one about Black Lives Matter. Undoubtedly, the persons who smashed it into bits under the cover of darkness last weekend also think of themselves as the children of God. But we forgive those people because God forgives, not, necess not necessarily because we really want to. And that painted trotter has been glued and duct taped back together and will soon be back out there on our front lawn. The gospel passage concludes with rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. But we don't. We don't have to wait for eternity to see the kingdom because it is in our midst. In the fourth chapter of Matthew, Jesus proclaims the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that kingdom is any place where God reigns. That vision of the kingdom of heaven comes to us whenever a person has faith and truly believes in the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ. My brothers and sisters, I have shared these thoughts and words with you this morning by the love of the Father, the grace of the Son, and the healing power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're now going to celebrate communion, and we invite you to join with us uh, from your own homes with your own elements if you wish. But first, let's join in our communion prayer. We thank you, our Father, for that life which you have made known to us by Jesus, your Son, by whom you made all things and take care of the whole world. You sent him to become man for your salvation. You allowed him to suffer and to die. You raised him up, glorified him, and have set him at your right hand, and in him you have promised us the life eternal. O Lord Almighty, eternal God, gather together your church from the ends of the earth into your kingdom, as grain was once scattered, and now has become one loaf. Our Father, we also thank you for the precious blood of Jesus Christ, which was shed for us and for his precious body as himself appointed us to proclaim his death. For through him glory is to be given to you forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I share with you what has been shared from the very beginning, that at that last night with his disciples, Jesus took bread from the table and blessed it, and then he broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Whenever you eat it, remember me. In a similar manner, at the end of the meal, he took the cup, and after he blessed it, he said, this is a new covenant to be shared and shed in my blood. Whenever you drink this, remember me for I shall not drink it again until I share it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The gifts of God for the people of God by the grace of God. Amen. So take, eat. It represents the body of our Savior. This is the cup of salvation, shed in Jesus' blood. Drink, drink your fill. And know that all has been given for you. By the grace of our Lord, amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thanks and praise to you. Again, you have fed us at your holy table with your body and blood. By your word and this holy supper, may we be led from this world of sorrow into life eternal. 
Amen. And so, my friends, as we journey out into the world with our own lives, remember the grace and love of Jesus and of our Heavenly Father, and may his wisdom and care go with all of you today and in all the days to come. Amen.